Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. I'm Ben Olson, that's Nathan Fox. We're the founders of LSATdemon.com and our weekly podcast, Thinking LSAT. Today we have a special episode on the recent Supreme Court decision, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard. This just came out today. This is Thursday, June 29th. We are not legal experts, but we're curious about how this is going to affect our students and those applying to law school. What effect will this decision have for them? Um, I don't know that we have answers, do we, Nate? <laughs> well, what happened, right? The the cases were decided in favor of the plaintiff. Plaintiff was um, a nonprofit on behalf of Asian American students who said they had been discriminated against. I, I think it was Asian American students, but I'm, I'm not sure. But anyways, it's this nonprofit who is saying, hey, in separate suits, University of North Carolina and Harvard College, you guys are uh, violating these people's rights. Um, how are you violating their rights? Well, there's an equal protection law, uh, equal protection clause of the Constitution of the United States that says that the government can't deny any um, that everybody needs equal protection under the laws. And then there's Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which says, is that right? Am I quoting that right? Title VI, yep. Okay, of the Civil Rights Act that says that this applies essentially if if the school gets federal funding, it applies. So that's how Harvard is involved. Yep. Okay. If we understand that correctly, I don't know. Ben and we, I spent like 30 minutes trying to figure out if that was actually the we're, justification. We're trying to figure, yeah. How does it get exactly to Harvard, a private school, but... Whatever it ben clearly and I are both does. Law no one graduates, by the way. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the ruling is essentially your your policies, which explicitly use race, your admissions programs, your admissions like policies, which explicitly use race, uh, are therefore illegal. You're violating yep. Title Six says you cannot use race if you get federal funding, and so th these violate that. It's funny to say Title Six though, because when we're reading through this opinion. There's no discussion of Not that, a lot. right? It's, it's all focused on the Equal Protection Clause, but whatever. Right, right. And that might be because of, you know, mountains of equal protection jurisprudence in the last four decades, right? They're, they're citing like endlessly. These issues have been, it's like well-covered ground, basically. Yeah, we, we just, I just don't remember. And, but this is where we're at, right? So somehow they, they've, said, no, this isn't constitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. Okay. So let's, we can look here at, we get, a, I thought it was really interesting and Ben did too, from the syllabus of the opinion, which by the way, we'll link to the actual opinion. You go knock yourself out. I do recommend reading at least the syllabus. The syllabus is an eight page summary of a lengthy opinion. There are also concurrences and dissents, but the syllabus, which is describes at the very top, it describes the Harvard admissions process. Now we're not talking about Harvard law school. We're talking about Harvard undergrad, but here's, here's what the undergrad, here's what the process looks like, uh, at Harvard. You want to read it, Ben? Yeah. And I want to say one more thing about that. The, yeah. the, um, <laughs> syllabus or is that, is that what they call it? They call it the syllabus. Yes. That, I don't know that opening thing. But mm -hmm. anyways, that's eight pages, right? If you can't get through that, <laughs> yeah. Law probably isn't for you. I mean, yeah. this is the kind of stuff that you do over and over in law school. And this opinion is uh, a 237-page uh, document. Um, I mean, the opinion of the court is much shorter than that because there's dissents and so forth. And there's a lot of stuff that when you read through a case, you skip over because you're not reading the citations. But even then, you do some on some case on some level want to read those and see exactly why they're citing that case because <laughs> they'll put that information in the parentheses, right? But yeah. anyways. Well, if also, you hate this, this is not for you. Yeah. And and I think it, it if you were ever going to actually do this kind of work, mm -hmm. right? Like if you think if and I mean, many of our students want to be involved in these kinds of issues. If you if you were ever going to like be involved in future litigation following this precedent, you're going to read that syllabus and you're going to read the entire opinion, all the dissents, and you're going to follow like all the footnotes mm -hmm. to read all of the other opinions <laughs> that they're citing so that you can see how this crazy, you know, interpretation of laws has come to be so that you can then win a case for your client. Yeah. Um, like you should be into this stuff or you should nerd yeah. out on this stuff. Not, not necessarily this particular case. If this issue doesn't interest you, then again, because you're about to apply to law school, it does it's, and it's about college admissions. It does apply to you potentially. Yeah. Um, Okay. 
Okay. So okay. Well, yeah, this. I want to hear yeah. this. Uh, this is crazy. Go ahead. Okay. So it says at Harvard, each application for admission is initially screened by a quote first reader who assigns a numeric score in each of six categories, academic, extracurricular, athletic, school support, personal, and overall. For the overall category, a composite of the five other ratings, wow. a first reader can and does consider the applicant's race. Why don't you just give me the five other ratings? You just listed the six categories and then you're... Okay, anyway, in the, in the, under the category of uh, overall... One of the five things there is race. One, yeah, one of, yeah. Let's just hear what they are. But anyways, it's <laughs> one of five in the yeah. sixth category. Yeah. Okay. Harvard's admissions subcommittees then review all applications from a particular geographic area. Okay, so you have a first reader, an individual reviewing your application, and then your application goes to a subcommittee, and that subcommittee is over some geographic area in the world. Okay. Maybe the east or the coast or the west coast or the south or whatever. Okay. These regional subcommittees make recommendations to the full admissions committee and they take an applicant's race into account. When the 40 member full admissions committee begins its deliberations, it discusses the relative breakdown of applicants by race. Okay, so we really have three tiers here, right? The first reader, the subcommittee, and then the final full committee. The goal of the process, according to Harvard's director of admissions, is ensuring there is no dramatic drop off in minority admissions from the prior class. An applicant receiving a majority of the full committee's votes is tentatively accepted for admission. So that means 40 people are voting on one well, applicant. <laughs> yeah, right? I want to note out. I want to note here that 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 almost sounds like a quota, which surely would be illegal. Right. They're like, well, our goal is to not drop off from a minority from a more from minority admissions. Yeah. I you said it's surely illegal? Well, I would think so. Like I mean quotas I think have been like long ago outlawed. Oh, I'm not sure yeah. what the I'm not sure what the precedent was on that, but like you, you're not allowed to say we're going to have 10% African American or whatever. You, hmm. you can't do that. But they that almost seems like they just kind of admitted that that's what they're doing. Now they're saying no dramatic drop. Oh, it's not a quota. We just can't have any dramatic drop off. Well, then we argue about what dramatic means. Yeah. Does it mean one under a certain amount like or one under last year? Because if yeah. you have to have at, at least as many as you did last year, then that sounds like a quota. But OK, anyway. Yeah. Uh, the opinion continues, an applicant receiving a majority of the full committee's votes is tentatively accepted for admission. At the end of this process, the racial composition of the tentative applicant pool is disclosed to the committee. Okay. Yeah, that does. That's interesting. That's really so now they're, now the they're re reporting stats yep. on race. Okay. The last stage of Harvard's admissions process called the LOP winnows the list of tentatively admitted students to, to arrive at the final class. Applicants that Harvard considers cutting at this stage are placed on the LOP list, which contains <laughs> Hardcore. I can't yeah. believe they call it that. I mean, that's, <laughs> it's so casual, but yeah. Yeah. Which contains only four pieces of information. Only this is four nuts. This is nuts right here, but go yeah, ahead. Okay. Well, interestingly, we went from six and then actually really what, 11 or no? Yeah. Well, who knows what the other, because the other six might've also had sub points. They oh, that's do. true. Right. Yeah. So who yeah. knows how many categories, but now we're going yeah. down to four pieces of information. What are they? Legacy status, recruited athlete status, financial aid eligibility, and race. I was like, wow, what? So I mean, <laughs> a lot went into it before we got to this part, right? So yep. we, if we emphasize this lop list, it's going to start to look real weird real fast. Yeah. But so we have we have to acknowledge that there was this whole complicated process where they built potentially the majority of their class. Yeah. And then this is just, well, look, we got 100 people we really want, but we can only admit 90. Or whatever it is. We got whatever, yeah. A thousand sure. people we want to admit, but we can only admit nine hundred. Like what do we yep. do? Yep. Right. But then <laughs> it is insane here that we now only get four pieces of information about the candidate. 
and maybe it, it, it might be something like, okay. Cause in my example, we got a thousand people we really like, we can only keep 900 of them to get to that. I guess we don't know how they get to the lop list. Oh, sorry. It was the previous step was the tentative admission thing, right? Yep. So how many do they offer tentative? Like I've got tentative admission on say 800 of them. They haven't offered admission to these folks yet. They're still no. deciding, but who they're, they're like lop. Yeah. They're, so they got the thousand. They got to cut it to nine hundred, right? So it seems like yeah. they might. So they might be going like, well, five hundred. These five hundred are in for sure, or you know, got, we're proud that these guys are in, or yeah. the or eight hundred of them are in, and then the ones that aren't tentatively in are on the lop list. How many people are on the lop list? I don't know, right? It could be two hundred to cut one hundred, or it yep. could be. 500 to cut 100, or it could be 120 to cut 100. I, I really don't know. <laughs> but then there's only four pieces of information that they get to know. Legacy status. Yep. That's probably not yes or no. Because if it, I mean, no is probably no. Yes is here are the, <laughs> all of the other graduate Harvard grads in this person's like lineage and how much yeah. money they have donated to the school, et cetera. Which... Okay, so your lineage w were admitted to Harvard. Yes. That seems well, like almost <laughs> like an anti-race like True, factor. right. Okay, right, which ha Harvard has historically discriminated against blacks. I mean, I was reading about some of the history of it, and it yeah. was like slaves used to serve the people who were in charge of Harvard. Like it, it's been it's been explicitly racist in its long history. Um, yeah. So, so even though just, now they're trying to like completely go the other way. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and even just, well, I don't know if you want to ignore race, but if you just talk about it race neutrally, what does legacy status do? It enshrines the status quo. Right. Right. Which obviously has racial implications, but that's an odd thing to be up there. Why do well, schools consider <laughs> legacy? <laughs> because your grandpa built us this building that we're sitting in. But not all legacy, um, right? well, not all, but the legacy status is going to be there at this stage to make sure that we're not lopping the wrong person. So are they really looking at legacy status or are they looking at who is in their legacy status? Probably both is what I would say, is what I would think. Because I wonder, why would yes. you give a fuck about a, someone who had their dad go to Harvard, but that person, that dad has done nothing or that right. mom has done nothing like is it really legacy status or is it really donation status? They just not willing to say that. So they say legacy status and they mm. let them check it. Mm. That's a lot nicer to just call that legacy status, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm wildly speculating we don't know, here. <laughs> but we can assume, right? Like we know, but not like there's human nature and there's reality. Like, you know, is it shocking that billionaires have a lot of swing? Of course they do. Yeah. So, Okay. And, and, you know, there were other factors to get them here. So sure, sure. it's not like I, this is just, Oh, some idiot who applies and you're like, well, but legacy. So we have to admit them. Yeah. Although this is a crucial step, right? Because the, the vast, ma <laughs> most competitions are won and lost at the very edge of competition, not right. The people who just had no chance. Right. This anywhere. is what could have gotten them into the, yeah, like into the conversation to begin with. Right. I mean, it sounds like it, at Harvard, they're basically assuming everybody's a no. Yeah. And then they're voting from this committee and you need a majority of the votes on the committee to get you even onto that tentative list in the first place. Yeah. So, but <laughs> legacy status was probably considered at that stage as well. Okay. Uh, the next one, recruited athlete status. That also to me sounds financially related, right? Like this is someone who can bring money yeah. to the school. Yeah, not going to, well, prestige, like we just, we, you know, even if it's not like bring money to the school, like a, a superstar, uh, oh, no, sing. not necessarily, but if they do well on the team, the team does well, that brings recognition. Right, and, right, right. In, yeah, no, we're yeah, Harvard, so we have to have the best fencing team. So yeah. we give a scholarship to this person. This, that part's not going to apply at all to law school admissions, but, uh, okay. So that's, <laughs> they're thinking, are you a legacy? Maybe we can't chop you. Are you a lop you? Are you a recruited athlete? Maybe we can't lop you either. Yep. This third one was the killer. This is where Ooh. I was just like, fuck. Financial aid eligibility. Yeah. So how do you think they're using that? <laughs> they want you to have financial aid eligibility because they want you to, they, they, well. I oh. thought it was the opposite. 
I thought it was, oh, this person's eligible financial aid. So that means we're going to have to charge less to them. Uh, I mean, this number could be used in any way they want, right? But uh, someone who is eligible for oh, financial I aid well, is not going to have to pay as much. Uh, yeah, either that or they want you to be eligible for financial aid because they want you to be able to borrow the money to go to the school. I'm sure that's a factor as well. <laughs> Can this person borrow enough money to come here? Or if they can't, do they do have, they have the enough means? money to pay to go here? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> like I think I just, I'm, I'm so yeah. cynical here and I'm, I'm sorry if there's some other no, much more benign reason for having this as one of the yeah. final factors, but I'm, yeah, please. I'd love to know. Okay. And last one is race. Yeah. Is race. So at that point they can decide like, well, we're, and you know, we are assuming that Harvard is not lopping people because of their race. We're assuming that they would see, you know, oh, this is an underrepresented minority and we are going to not lop them because of their race. Well, I guess to play devil's advocate, I guess this is where what the group that was suing, was it, were they suing Harvard or yeah. were they suing UNC? They were uh, Asian American group. Is that right? I, 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 well, I don't know if it was an Asian American group, but I think they had at least one Asian American plaintiff. Yes. So they uh, would argue the opposite. One or both right? of these cases. Yeah. That will, yeah. right. They're saying, no, you're, you're lopping me because I'm Asian. And that's the problem with this kind of like race conscious. Yeah. That's at least that's what the majority that's, ends up holding here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. To go on. It, Sometimes students are like question whether uh, what we do when we teach them LSAT logical reasoning is actually relevant to uh, like their life as a lawyer. Sure. And as I was reading this part, I was like, yeah, your LSAT prep is going to help you to understand this better. It the majority. This is again for the syllabus, but the majority uh, held, according to the syllabus, that any exceptions to the Equal Protections Clause guarantee must survive a daunting two-step examination known as strict scrutiny, scrutiny um, which came from, I guess that maybe that came from Adirond. There's a citation here, which asks first whether racial classification is used to, quote, further compelling governmental interests. Uh, that was from Grutter. And second, whether the government's use of race is narrowly tailored, i.e. necessary, to achieve the interest, which came from Fisher. Necessary on the LSAT means you have to have this or you can't have that other thing. In other words, this is saying that if you can't do this in any other way, then you can't do it at all. Right? Yeah. There, so strict scrutiny has two requirements, two necessary conditions, right? One, it has to further compelling governmental interest. And two, the way in yeah. which you do it has to be necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Respondents, Harvard or, and North Carolina, yep. suggest that the 25-year expectation in Grutter means that race-based preferences must be allowed to continue until at least 2028. And that's where I, I, I laughed already because the, the, the finding in Grutter or the holding in Grutter was like, so there was a, there was a line in there that basically said, I mean, it said something along the lines of we won't have to make this same ruling 25 years from now because there was a there was a ruling. There was a holding as well that these programs also had to have an end. Mm. I think that was by Sandra Day O'Connor. I think I you might this, be right. I seem to remember that. But anyways. Yeah. Uh, so listen, I laughed because I saw them working here. Look at the argument that they're making, right? So Sandra Day O'Connor has said, I don't think we'd have to make the same thing, twenty, the same ruling 25 years from now. Respondents then go, oh, well, so that means that we have to have until 2028 until we can, uh, whatever. Yeah. Such a, <laughs> the constitution has this weird, like timeline. <laughs> Well, because Sandra Day O'Connor said, if it was her, was she still yeah. on the court in 2023 or 20, oh, 2003? I think so. Okay. Um, yeah. So because she had said, I don't think we'll have to rule this way 25 years from now, <laughs> then 20, 20 years from now, or what, sorry, whatever, I'm messing up the timeline, but like, <laughs> it's not yet been 25 years. And That's itself the, confusing sufficient for necessary, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. They're like, oh, so that means it has to stay for 25 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the court, though, in this case, 
our court in the, that we're talking about now yeah. um, says, yeah, but that case, Grutter, the court's statement in Grutter reflected only the court's expectation that race based preferences would by 2028 be unnecessary in the context of racial diversity on college campuses. And so this is like it, it's I think I've really bungled my explanation, but it points out this is exactly the type of thing that you're going to be doing on LSAT logical reasoning where you're yeah. like, we didn't say that we need to keep these for 28 years. We simply said that or for 25 years, we simply said that we don't think we will need them 25 years from now. Yeah. And that's which just not- really is saying nothing. Right. All it says is you might or might not. Right. It was certainly wasn't a whole thing that said that this has to stick around for 25 years. Yeah. I pulled out some quotes from the Sotomayor's dissent, but you had you wanted to talk a bit about the Roberts opinion, like because what we really want to talk about is where schools go from here. Right. And we're wildly speculating. We'll have more to say about this in the weeks and months and probably years to come. Uh, this is literally the same day that the, that the uh, decision came down. So we don't know that much about what we're talking about. But where if these schools like if you're Harvard or if you're UNC and if this applies to the law schools, do we know if it applies to the law schools? I'm assuming that it does. And I'm assuming that it does because of federal funding. Like what school does not have some yeah. ties to federal funding and therefore implicated in this decision? I don't know. <laughs> I wish you know I understood what schools. More. Do you know what schools have lots of ties to federal funding? Military schools. Military schools. Mm -hmm. And in Sotomayor's dissent, she pointed out that in a footnote, the court exempts military academies from its ruling in light of the, quote, potentially distinct interests they may represent. <laughs> yeah, freaking. <laughs> Sotomayor goes on and says, to the extent the court suggests national security interests are distinct, those interests cannot explain the court's narrow exemption as national security interests are also implicated at civilian universities. The court also attempts to justify its carve out based on the fact that no military academy is a party to these cases. What? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Yet the same can be said of many other institutions that are not parties here, including the religious universities supporting res respondents with the court does not similarly exempt from its sweeping opinion. There was a brief filed by Georgetown University, Catholic colleges and universities noting that they rely on the use of race in their holistic admissions to further not just their academic goals, but also their religious missions. The court's carve out, says Sotomayor, only highlights the arbitrariness of its decision and further proves that the 14th Amendment does not categorically prohibit the use of race in college admissions. That's her opinion. She yeah. goes on with a lengthy paragraph. I, I actually, I think I can read this to be clear. Yeah, go ahead and read this. Yeah. And then we'll yeah. talk about uh, Roberts. Okay. About what, because Roberts, Roberts essentially responded in his opinion, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So how many rounds did they get to go back and forth <laughs> seeing each other's documents before they print this? I don't know, but I have this feeling that there's definitely like, go, there is going back and forth. Right. It's it's laid yeah. out and they get to review it and they get yeah. to respond because they yeah. clearly are talking to each other. Yeah. Maybe it's just they can revise and revise up to the deadline and they put out yeah. their they 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 put it out there and see what their colleagues are going to say. I mean, we know that they do that. Right. We know that they draft opinions for each other. Yeah. OK. Um. To be clear, today's decision leaves intact holistic college admissions and recruitment efforts that seek to enroll diverse classes without using racial classifications. Universities should, she uses the word should, Ben, which is kind of a bad <laughs> word on the LSAT. Yeah. Right. I mean, not, and when I say bad word, what I mean is you need to notice it. If somebody is saying somebody should do a thing, mm -hmm. that's like, whoa, really? Okay. So this is a Supreme Court justice now telling universities that they should continue to use those tools as best they can to recruit and admit students from different backgrounds based on all the other factors the court's opinion does not and cannot touch. Colleges and universities can continue to consider socioeconomic diversity and to recruit and enroll students who are first-generation college applicants or who speak multiple languages, for example. Those factors are not interchangeable with race. Uh, interchangeable meaning a bad, like something that you would not be able to use. And she says, no, that's not interchangeable with race. But, sorry, pause for a second. There. It's highly correlated with race, 
right? But sure. not interchangeable, which is something the LSAT goes into as well. It loves the um, yeah. <laughs> distinction between correlation and causation or any sort of tight. Oh, yeah. Like things can happen together, but not be the same. Yeah. Yep. Then, then there was the uh, Sotomayor included a testimony from a UNC alumna who said that her Latina identity, socioeconomic status and first generation college status are all important, but different parts to getting a full picture of who she is and how she sees the world. At FFA's own urging, those efforts remain constitutionally permissible. FFA is the petitioner here? Yeah, must be. See brief for petitioner. So it's it was yeah, the people. that brief for petitioner emphasizes race neutral alternatives at Harvard and UNC should implement. Oh, sorry. Emphasizes the alternatives that they should implement, such as those that focus on socioeconomic and geographic diversity, percentage plans. What? Plans that increase community college transfers and plans that develop partnerships with disadvantaged high schools. Oh, sorry. Percentage plans is a term used uh, for certain programs where, like, say, the top 50 percent of all high school students are going to get into a public school. That's yeah, what that so is. Texas Not racial does this. Yeah. yeah, Texas does this where the top 10 percent of all high schools get into their state yeah. schools. For OK, so what is I think what she's doing here, right? Justice Sotomayor is saying hey, there's lots of other ways that you can achieve essentially the same goal. Like instead of having the goal of race, try to have a goal of all the things that incorporate that are that are like touching race. Well, she's saying that and she's and the petitioners are saying that as well. Right. Oh, so and, right. And petitioners every, are saying so. So petitioners apparently, according to her, said socioeconomic and geographic diversity is OK. These percentage plans is OK. Plans that intre- that increase community college transfers is okay, and plans that develop partnerships with disadvantaged high schools those are okay. Well, I mean, that would seem to narrow this ruling a lot if that were in fact true, right? And then she cites a concurrence from Justice Thomas arguing that universities can consider race-neutral policies similar to those adopted in states such as California and Michigan and that universities can consider status as a first-generation college applicant, financial means, and generational inheritance or otherwise. That also is citing a Kavanaugh concurrence and a Gorsuch uh, Gorsuch concurrence. Yeah. Huh. And then, though, (laughs) what did Thomas say in response? Uh, So, yeah, Roberts... Uh, Robert stuff. Well, and the reason I was reading this or trying to get through this before is because I was trying to figure out, okay, how much, uh, what can an applicant do under this ruling, right? Yeah. To <laughs> either leverage their race or whatnot. Because before it was pretty simple, right? Even in the estimator, we had this box. It's like, yes, I am an underrepresented minority. Check. And then, whoa, that affects your chances of getting in. That affects your chances of getting a scholarship and so forth. And so it's like, okay, this opinion just came down. What does that mean for people applying today? One, we don't know if it's going to apply to law schools, but if it does, and I presume it will, okay, you can't just check a box and say, this is your race. But Roberts did allude, not allude, explicitly said that you can talk about these things in your application essay. So... Are people going to start doing that? Almost certainly. And this is, but I was curious, how far did he think people could go with this? And this is in the last paragraph. No, no, sorry. Last section of the opinion of the court. Let's see, hold on. We have never permitted admissions programs to work in that way. In other words, based on race. And we will not do so today. Okay. At the same time, as all parties agree, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an application, applicate, applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. So an applicant can clearly talk about this. You don't need to hide your race. Okay. But, Roberts continues, despite the dissent's assertion to the contrary, universities may not simply establish through application essays or other means the regime we hold unlawful today. And then in parentheses, Roberts continues, a dissenting opinion is generally not the best source of legal advice on how to comply with the majority opinion. (laughs) Yikes. 
<laughs> so thanks, Sotomayor, but no, that's what Roberts is saying. <laughs> yeah, back but to what does he really say? I mean, he doesn't say. I don't know. He he acknowledges that you can. The applicant can certainly talk about their race. Yeah. He, he's just saying you can't entirely recreate what you've been doing so far. So basically, oh, let's have the first reader look through the essay, figure out whether this applicant is an underrepresented minority, and then just throw that back into some statistical pool that we use to lop well, candidates, right? Okay, so like let's that. go back. I want to look at, I want to go back to the lop list whole thing. I want to, I want to look at this process, right? Yeah. So- at Harvard, each application for admission is initially screened by a first reader who assigns a numerical score in each of six categories, academic, extracurricular, athletic, school support, personal, and overall. Mm -hmm. Okay. In overall, race is considered. Yep. Okay. Am I allowed to just change that to say, uh, we are considering the high school they went to? Yes. The funding of the high school they went to? Yes. The racial composition of the high school they went to? I don't know. I'm not talking about, this isn't the applicants, right? Like, are we allowed to ask applicants for their race? <laughs> I don't are know. Are we allowed? I mean, and this is kind of like where we're I going. I think no. I think. Potentially, but, right? Yeah. But does the law, does the case say it explicitly? We don't know. So then what happens is this is meant to be like guidance for what schools are supposed to do. Yeah. And. So the schools are going to have to try to comply with this so that they don't get sued. But yeah, it's it's really unclear where the limits are, because like, OK, what if U.S. News and World Report calls me and says, uh, although I shouldn't say U.S. News because they don't even consider race when they're ranking law schools. But what if um, I don't know, a reporter calls you and says uh, how what percentage of your class is black? Are you allowed to answer that question? Because that's backward looking. So surely you're allowed to report statistics about the racial composition of your class. It would be hard not to know that. And then if you know that, how do you not share that? Maybe, maybe the court is just primarily concerned with uh, the decision process, but even then, yeah, maybe they don't care as long as it's not explicitly as part of, of yeah, part of that process. Yeah, I think that's the thing is that you just have to stop saying that it's explicitly part of the process. Yeah. Except it is part of the process insofar as an applicant talks about it in their personal statement and what it meant to them in their unique experience in the world. And then we are allowed to consider it. So here's my theory. Of course, it's wild speculation, but I, I would imagine that if I were able to get into Robert's head, Robert wants, or doesn't, I don't know that he wants, but he is open to an individual reader looking at an applicant, reading about their race, and then, and then extrapolating from whatever they say about their race. Oh, you've overcome a challenge yeah. or a hardship or something. And then that affects their numbers in these non-racial categories. So it, it can affect those things, but you can't have an explicit category called race. As soon as you've done that, you've gone over the line. So race is still a part of this process, but it's becoming a much more non-quantifiable, untrackable, maybe? Yeah, which we have been kind of anticipating. Schools are already moving in this direction. It's not a new thing in many places. There was like 10 states, including California, which explicitly got rid of like, you cannot use race in your, um, yeah. in your, uh, applications process at all. And they have then done all of these things that Sotomayor is suggesting. And that even the, the plaintiff in this case is suggesting, yeah. uh, just looking at all these other factors like socioeconomic status. Wait, does socioeconomic, does socio, does that part of it, does that mean, does that include race? Yeah. What does that mean? So I don't know. The social aspect of it. I don't okay. know. Economic status, um, yeah. like where the other factors that <laughs> may or may not be correlated. Yeah. Okay. So what's going to happen for law school applicants? I suspect a lot more uh, URMs are going to start writing about their diversity in their personal statement. Or at least more people are going to submit diversity statements at the very least. 
Yeah, I, I'm very curious whether schools are asked are, are allowed to ask for the racial composition of the school of the high school you went to. Do they need to ask? They can just figure that out. <laughs> they could pretty... go to the look at the yearbook. They could just have a class photo. But <laughs> then start... does that then that becomes part of their process, right? Like if they're if they're if you get a job there and they're like, oh, by the way, this high school has this racial composition. You're already explicitly bringing race into the process, so. What they're going to have to do is say, hey, here is the um, median income for this zip code or the median income. They're going to have to look to these other factors. I suspect. I just don't see how you can bring a race explicitly into any sort of numeric part of the application process without implicating this decision. Yeah, but a class photo. <laughs> everyone, in the, everyone in the class all in one photo and you just kind of go like. Yep. Like, you're, 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 you're kind of like randomly selecting class. out of that photo, right? So you're just like, okay, does this, we want more that looks like this or do we want more that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what schools are going to do, but it, that, all this does really on some level, right, is creates a hurdle. So then schools are going to say, hey, look, it's easier to get what we want by going to these other metrics. And you can, you just, you just um, increase the number of students you accept from lower median income areas. I think there are many ways that they can try to achieve uh, different types of diversity in their schools. All sorts of ways. And that's what uh, they're going to look this for. Ruling, yeah. Apparently. I mean, now what might future cases does like hold, right? They, they like, I could see someone bringing suit three years from now saying, Hey, Harvard, the racial composition of your class is exactly the same as it was in 2023 when this ruling was decided. You are in fact doing the same thing you were doing before, just in like using different terms. I guess it's a much harder argument to make though, at that point that like any individual has been discriminated against. Yeah. Well, if you, sh yeah, yeah. Cause it, it's not going to come down to the individual. It's going to come down to these other factors, which you can discriminate on the basis of. Yeah, in their particular case, the reason why they're not there is because of the school just says any of these other facts. Well, at race, we never even looked at their race. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I think we've said everything we can. We said way more than we can say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're still um, here, yeah. Thanks for listening. <laughs> that that's our wild speculations. We'll we'll develop uh, more and more sensible opinions about all of these issues in the weeks to come. Want to say anything else? No. Thanks for listening. Email daily at lsatdemon.com if you'd like to ask us a question or share some LSAT or law school admissions news. Thanks for listening.